organizers for allowing me to come and share some of the results from KBSS MOSFIRE, which is a large near-infrared spectroscopic survey of high redshift galaxies that I've been conducting with my advisor, Chuck Seidel, over the last few years. Um, the KBSS, um, or the Keck Baron Extractor Survey, is a targeted spectroscopic survey of high redshift galaxies in fields around 15 bright quasars, which allows us to investigate the relationship between gas and galaxies in the same cosmological volumes. So if you're more interested in the CGM, look for papers from Gwen Rudy um, or Monica Turner. Um, they're the ones who discuss the, the gas content. So in addition to being an interesting uh, redshift range for science, being the uh, epic of peak ga galaxy assembly and black hole <coughs> mass accretion, redshifts two to three also offer a number of practical advantages in the sense that galaxies at these redshifts are accessible in the rest UV and rest optical from the ground, and they have relatively high number densities on the sky and are accessible with facilities like Keck, so we can hope to uh, collect statistical samples. So this is the status of the KBSS as of this spring. We have almost 1,000 galaxies with MOSFIRE uh, redshifts. Almost 700 of these we know to be between redshifts 2 and 2.7 with MOSFIRE spectroscopy in at least one, but usually two bands. Over 200 of these galaxies have good detections of all of the strong diagnostic lines in the rest optical, and these are the ones that I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk talking about. So these are a few examples of galaxies in our sample. Um, so when I talk about the strong diagnostic lines, I mean uh, H alpha, H beta, O3, O2, N2, sulfur 2, um, and in some cases we also have neon 3, although it's, it's long words of O2. Um, here. So this is just a small sort of specially selected sample, but you can already see that we have things with low ionization, more extreme ionization and excitation properties like BXX60, some with continuum, and then other things that look to be very young and metal poor. But what does a typical galaxy look like? We have solar masses ranging from about 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 11. Uh, 0.5 solar, or solar masses with a median stellar mass of about 10 to the 10 and a median star formation rate of about 30 solar masses a year. Extinction along the line of sight to these galaxies tends to be moderate with a median EB minus V nebular of 0.3. So to the meat of the talk, uh, this uh, plot should be familiar to some of you at least. It's the uh, classic N2 BPT diagram from the Baldwin, Phillips, and Turlovich paper from 1981 that plots uh, O3 of H beta versus N2 of H alpha and in the local universe is used primarily as a way of separating galaxies that look a lot like H2 regions, so the star forming sequence here, from those that have contributions or are dominated by harder ionizing uh, radiation fields like AGN. So this is the AGN branch. Uh, for orientation's sake, I've put the maximum starburst line from Cooley et al. Uh, in red, which is essentially the fold over point in the photo ionization modeling surface for an extreme very hot starburst. And the orange contour encloses 90% of the Sloan sample, which gives you an idea of the parameter space occupied by typical local galaxies. If we look at the high redshift sample from the KBSS, you immediately see that something appears to be different, and this has been known for a long time. Um, they're either at higher O3 of H beta, higher into H alpha, or maybe both. Uh, we can look at this more quantitatively with uh, medians in O3 of H beta, which are the gold stars, um, but also a fit um, to the high redshift sequence which is, is plotted in cyan. So the cyan is the ridge line of the KBSS sample, which is very clearly offset from uh, local galaxies. And this was the subject of our 2014 paper that came out last fall. But now, of course, we have an opportunity to look at a number of other uh, line ratios and excitation diagrams. So this is the sulfur-2 BPT diagram, which exchanges uh, nitrogen-2 for sulfur-2 on the x-axis, and you immediately see that things are a little bit different in this parameter space. There, I was a little surprised that things appeared to be largely consistent uh, with the Sloan galaxies. Um, you know, even if it's the high uh, excitation tail of Sloan, the high redshift galaxies sort of lay more or less on top of uh, the local galaxies. Although it is important to note that the fit and the median sort of run along the upper envelope of these 90% contours, and about 50 to 60% of our sample have O3 over H beta higher, um, O3 over H beta at fixed sulfur 2 over H alpha higher than uh, sort of this envelope. So we can also look um, at other line ratios, uh, including those that rely only on oxygen um, and hydrogen, oxygen being a very abundant uh, 
element with a number of strong lines in the optical band paths. Um, and two common line ratios are R23 and O32, um, which are used as uh, abundance indicators and proxies for ionization parameter, respectively, and often used together, um, O32 being used to break the degeneracy between the low metallicity and high metallicity branch of R23. Um, but note that in the local universe, there's a turnover point for R23, so there's a maximum value of this uh, line ratio that's observed uh, in the local universe. So on the right-hand side is uh, O32 versus R23 for the Sun galaxies in gray and the KBSS galaxies in green. And you see largely what we saw in the sulfur 2 BPT diagram, that the, the majority of high redshift galaxies appear to be consistent with this high ionization excitation tail of Sloan. Although, if we look at the maximum value of R23 from at least this local calibration, you can see that although you know, there seems to be a pretty sort of clear envelope for the Sloan galaxies, that there is a non-negligible fraction of high redshift galaxies that occupy this region of parameter space that is very challenging to explain with photoionization models. Um, okay, so this uh, explaining this offset with just the BPT diagram was the focus of, was part of the focus of our 2014 paper, but now we can try and disentangle what uh, the real reasons are using the full suite of information now available to us. And I'm going to try and go through all of these in the last few minutes. Um, in order to assess the impact of these you know, different reasons, we can separate the galaxy along the ridgeline um, into galaxies that are uh, more offset from Sloan in blue and those that are more consistent with local galaxies in red and orange. And on the right hand side, you can see although they share very similar distributions in star formation rate. The offset galaxies are systematically lower mass than the galaxies more consistent with local galaxies, and so therefore have um, higher specific star formation rates, and therefore perhaps higher uh, gas masses or gas fractions, as we heard from Linda. Um, so looking at the distribution of some of these properties now divided by their offset, um, so this is O32, which I'm using as a proxy for ionization parameter as a function of global galaxy properties, stellar mass, and star formation rate. And you can see that, unsurprisingly, the high redshift galaxies are higher, um, with the most offset galaxies exhibiting the highest values of O32 relative to Sloan. Um, we can also look at this as a function of the other indicators that are used um, as proxies for uh, oxygen abundance. So not just R23, but N2 over H alpha, which is one of the axes in the BBT diagram, and O3 and 2. And you do see some shifts here, which maybe you didn't see um, here, I guess, um, that you didn't see in the O32 R23 plot. But both of these parameters, these line ratio combinations, can be affected by the next thing that I'm going to talk about, which is the potential of nitrogen to oxygen variations at high redshift relative to the local universe. So this is um, nitrogen to oxygen ratios for uh, about 130 galaxies, so one of the largest samples um, currently available at high redshift as a function of stellar mass and um, inferred oxygen abundance. And you can see that there does appear to be a difference with stellar mass, but that as a function of metallicity, um, the nitrogen to oxygen ratios for the high redshift universe appear to be you know, fairly consistent um, with low metallicity local galaxies, but perhaps maybe a little um, higher. Um, and then this is the fit uh, to all of the KBSS galaxies. So the last thing I want to talk about is whether or not we can explain these line ratios using a self-consistent model. Um, and these, in our, this in our paper, use a very hot black body. But here, the orange and red points are using V-pass models um, from the newest release from Stanway and Eldridge. And you can see that we actually do, we can almost explain the sort of maybe ridge line of, of our galaxies using the same set of models, which might be telling us something about changes in the shape of the underlying uh, sort of ionizing radiation in these galaxies. Um, so since I think I'm running out of time, um, we see an offset in the N2BPD diagram, perhaps, but not a large change in the other diagnostic diagrams. But how do we explain all of this together? Um, there are a couple of options. Um, larger ionization parameters appear to be exhibited by the high redshift galaxies. Um, there might be some differences in nitrogen to oxygen ratios at high redshift relative to local, um, but also we think that by incorporating realistic uh, stellar population models, which do appear to have hotter ionizing uh, spectra from 1 to 4 Rydbergs, that helps us capture the behavior of these galaxies in all of the line ratios. So thank you. Thank you.
question for Alex. So I might have missed some beautiful data and analysis. Did you did you do something in the selection to preferentially uh, not select Seifert type emission galaxies? Uh, you mean Aegean? Yeah. Uh, so no, uh, so the, the galaxy selection is the typical UGR selection from um, Chuck students' papers over the course of the last few years. But we don't think there's a lot of contribution from AGN. We don't see um, a lot of the high ionization lines in the REST-UV. We don't see anything in stacks of Chandra data. And in stacks of the REST optical, we don't see much broad emission or high ionization lines there either. Right, so this is something that I'm still working on and need to think a little more carefully about. But from my understanding, from talking to um, JJ and Elizabeth a few weeks ago at, at the meeting at Carnegie, that it's largely a natural consequence of including um, stars that remain hotter for longer as a function of, or as a result of their binary interactions. Um, but I don't know what the Wolf Ray contributions are in, in BPAS exactly relative to Starburst 99, which also give similar results. So. Yeah, I, which is like curious, right? Because Starburst 99 includes rotation, BPAS includes binaries, but I think the overall effect of including what appears to be more realistic stellar evolution is to make the, the ionizing spectra look like hotter black bodies. So, so the rotating Starburst 99. Yes, the rotating Starburst oh. 99. Sorry, not just the basic Starburst 99. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and the, the metallicities I chose here are the ones that make them consistent with stacks of the rest UV spectra. So, even though these aren't necessarily the metallicities you would infer from the gas, it's consistent with the absorption lines that we see in the rest UV. Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for